Hello, Student of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker with a exercise to basically walk through one of these relative motion problems that has slipping between moving bodies. And we'll go through vectors for both the velocity as well as the acceleration and kind of talk through how we can set up our overall equation for this problem. All right, so looking at the system that we're given, before we start answering those questions, kind of getting our brain around what's going on, we have two fixed axis rotation pins, one of those here at point A, one of those over here at point D, which puts both bodies, both A, B, and also C, D, in fixed axis rotation around those individual points. So we basically have constraints coming from both ends. And then we have a collar. This collar is named collar C, and it's going to move up and down rod AB as the system moves. All right, so that's the general idea. We are given some information about alphas and omegas. We're given that both the angular velocity omega of AB as well as the angular acceleration alpha of AB are both positive from the right-hand rule. Now, it turns out that it's a really good assumption, at least to start with, that if your omega and alpha are going in the same direction on one body, it's super, super likely your omega and alpha will be going in the same direction on other bodies. It's also highly likely that your linear velocities and linear tangential accelerations will be going in the same direction at points. Okay. Now, I have seen this. Um, not be true on 100% of problems, but I would say it's true on 90 to 95% of problems. And so if arm AB is sliding, basically rotating upwards, it should make sense that my omega, at least for an assumption, omega of CD as well as my alpha of CD are also going to be in the same direction, both negative from the right-hand rule. And then another thing we could map on here while we're doing this, if both of these arms go up, basically collar C is going to need to slide up this arm. Okay, so this is going to get into the slipping velocity. Now, one thing we need to do if we're going to use our marker point P mentality is we need to draw, let's draw AB. Okay, so there's that arm, there's point A, there's point B down on the end. And what we're going to do is we're going to place this point P underneath the collar. So the collar C is going to sit on top. Okay, so C is basically sitting in that same location of P. And as these arms both move, as AB rotates positive from the right-hand rule, CD rotates negative from the right-hand rule, we hopefully should be able to see that your slipping velocity, velocity of C relative to P, is going to go uh, up this arm, right? Essentially, as that distance between straight line distance between D and A um, kind of gets, I guess, it doesn't get shorter. A and D are both fixed, but as that arm swings upward into the minimum length between those in a straight line, we need the velocity of C relative to P going in that direction. As it gets past the straight line, so the straight line would look something like. The straight line looks something like this, then your velocity of C relative to P would go in the opposite direction. Now, with our omegas and alphas going in the same direction, it's also okay to assume that your acceleration of C relative to P tangential is going to be also going up this arm towards point A. Okay. Now, notation-wise, I'm not going to put in all my vector arrows above my vectors because we're drawing them right next to the vectors. That'll save myself a little bit of writing, a few um, less things going on on this very busy diagram that we're going to create. Okay, So a few things that we've discovered so far. One of those is that this is a four-bar linkage. The reason it's a four-bar linkage is because we have these constraints on either end. Fixed axis support at A, fixed axis support at D, and we have the motion coming toward the middle, meeting in the middle, which is analogous to a four-bar linkage. Additive motion, we tend to have one fixed axis pin and then everything moving in a very complex fashion around that pin, kind of adding one body onto the next. So to the second question here, do we need to sum our omegas and alphas? No. The reason that answer is no is because we only need to sum our omegas and alphas on additive motion problems, and the only bodies you need to worry about are the outer bodies. And there's another video very similar to this that is going to go through the same set of questions and is going to be an additive motion case. So you can take a look at that one. 
Is there a marker point P? Well, no, not given in the problem, but we created one. Okay, so we put that marker point P right underneath collar C. So basically, marker point P is on this body AB. Um, it has a third point now, point P. All right, so which point do we put on the left side of your equation? Question number three. I think that it's easiest to put the term on the left side of the equation, which is adjacent to point P. Okay, let's write our velocity equation first. It's the simpler of the two. So we could say the, the velocity, so adjacent to P is C, so the velocity of C. Now this does need to be written as a vector equation because it's not true for scalars, but it is true for vectors. So V of C is equal to, now if you think about V of C, I'll probably end up erasing this highlighting here a little bit later, but it's coming from point D, right? C is in fixed axis rotation around point D. And so the whole right side of my equation is essentially going to come from point A and is going to include the slipping terms. And they're going to meet together at basically summing up to be the velocity of C. So coming from uh, point A over here, it turns out that this first term will be the velocity of A. And then I'm going to add a relative velocity plus this velocity of P relative to A. And then I'm going to add my slipping velocity, which is the velocity of C relative to P. A couple things to note here is that in these first two terms on the right-hand side of the equation, that these points all need to be on the same rigid body. And that our final term out here is the slipping term. All right, let's look at expanding this equation out and identifying what are the knowns and unknowns in the equation. So in order to do that, I am going to take away these highlights. Let me draw in some position vectors. We have a position vector going all the way from A down to P, which is hiding underneath there. So that's going to be my R of A relative to P. I also have a position vector here going from D over to C. So I can label this my R of C relative to D. So taking a look at back to my equation, the velocity of C is in fixed axis rotation around D. So I can say that my omega of CD as a vector crossed with R of C relative to D as a vector, that is going to equal the velocity of C. Okay, so I've taken care of that one. The next term here, the velocity of A, any fixed axis rotation pin turns out to have a zero velocity. And so we can just go ahead and cancel that, that one out. That is a zero velocity no matter what instant we look at is just going to be a fixed pin. Now we have the velocity of P relative to A. This is also going to be based upon fixed axis rotation. My omega of AB, which is the body which contains point P, crossed with my R of the A relative to P. Oh, I just discovered I had uh, a flip here. I did it in two different places. Let me take care of this one over here first. This is not of A relative to P, which would point at point A. This is going to be of P relative to A. And additionally down here in my vector drawing, I am going to have this as P relative to A, right? It's always pointing at the term that's kind of above the slash. And so it's pointing at point P, so P relative to A. And then my final term that I have is going to be this slipping velocity, so plus this velocity of C relative to P. Now this last one here is going to be just a linear velocity. Um, we don't have any bodies, especially in a four bar linkage, that we're going to be accounting for their omega cross r. This tends to be an unknown. If we take a look at what the unknowns would be in this problem, it turns out that we were given omega of AB, so our unknowns are going to be the omega of CD and the velocity here of C relative to P. So two equations. The two equations come from splitting this out into the I hat components and then the J hat components. Now let's go ahead and draw these vectors since we've written these equations out. You can kind of go in either order if you want to write your equation first, draw your vectors. It's really kind of your choice or it can kind of be a, um, a synchronous activity as you work through it. So if we look at the velocity here of C, the velocity of C is going to come out of point C and it needs to match up with this omega right here. So our velocity of C is going to go perpendicular to arm CD, which is vertically upward. So there's my velocity, I'll put it over here on the side, just a touch of velocity of point C. Now, next looking at, we had no velocity of A, we don't need to worry about that one, but our velocity of P relative to A is gonna come out of point P. So it's gonna be perpendicular to this R vector, R of P relative to A. 
and let me scroll up here just a touch. I see that I was off the bottom of the screen there. So hopefully you caught that. That the, um, this is the velocity of C D. Excuse me, the radius of C D between C and D. So looking at now again the velocity of P relative to A, we have a positive right-hand rule omega of A B. So if I cross that into the R vector coming down here from A to point P, we end up with a velocity going up a little bit to the right. So this would be my velocity of P relative to A. And then the last velocity we had is already mapped on here. It's the slipping velocity of C relative to P. All right, so that gives me all of my velocity vectors, my omegas, and also my full velocity equation, as well as having it expanded out to be in specific terms. So before I jump into my acceleration, let's just cross-check this equation here as far as its subscripts. Remember that we can multiply these subscripts and we should end up getting things cancel out. So we end up with C on the left, and then looking at these three subscripts here, we have A and then P divided by A and then C divided by P. And I think here we can see what's gonna happen. A cancels with A, P cancels with P, and we get C equals C. Okay, so that actually answers, let's see here, question um, four, show that the subscripts on the right-hand side of the equation cancel when multiplied. And then we got rid of the terms and went to zero, the velocity of A, we expanded our terms, and we drew some vectors. Okay, so we've kind of been basically working through those waypoints. Now, let's go ahead and move into our acceleration equation. For the acceleration equation, I like to use the exact same subscripts I use for my velocity equation. I've already got my head around those. I've already drawn the R vectors, and it seems to be simplest to go with those. And so acceleration of C as a vector is going to equal the acceleration of A as a vector plus the acceleration of P relative to A. A as a vector plus the acceleration of C relative to P as a vector, the slipping term. All right, so remember that accelerations not only have a tangent term, but also have a normal term. Okay, so each one of these will get split into a tangent and a normal. And additionally, we're going to add our bonus Coriolis onto the final term out here, the acceleration of C relative to P. All right, so to fit this one in, I'm going to go ahead and scroll up. So writing out my full expanded equation with all my tangent and normal terms, we can say our acceleration of C tangential plus our acceleration of C normal is equal to our acceleration of A tangential plus our acceleration of A normal plus our acceleration relative of P relative to A tangential plus our acceleration of P relative to A normal plus our acceleration of C relative to P tangential, plus our slipping acceleration of C relative to P normal, plus our Coriolis. All right, so there's all our terms. Getting rid of things that go to zero, one of our favorite activities. Once again, point A is a fixed axis pin, so it doesn't have a tangent, it doesn't have a normal. Both of those can go away. We are going to have accelerations here for point C. It's basically based on that fixed axis rotation. There's an alpha for CD, therefore we'll have a tangent. There's also an omega for CD, so we'll have a normal. These relative two terms here, if you're still struggling with these, I'd take a look back at section 16.7 in the Hibbler textbook. They're fundamentally the um, relative terms between two points on the same body just like we covered in 16.7 and so these are going to be based upon actually this r vector right keep in mind that the r vector has the same subscripts as the acceleration vector so those are both non-zero and then the final terms here are three slipping terms we have a tangent term we've already drawn that here anticipating of a non-zero acceleration up this arm so that one's non-zero our acceleration of c relative to p normal this one is only non-zero if we have a curved slot okay so if this is a straight slot it's going to go to zero and the Coriolis pretty much never goes to zero it's going to be our omega of the body which contains point p crossed with the slipping velocity okay so filling in these terms let's start on the left work to our right so our acceleration of c tangential is going to be based upon the alpha of cd so alpha of cd as a vector crossed with r of c relative to d 
There's the first term. Next up, we'll add in the normal. Now, normal is always going to be, in a very general sense, a sub n is equal to omega squared and the negative r as a vector. And then a sub t as a vector is going to be alpha cross r. Okay, those are our fundamental equations we're going to use over and over and over. Sometimes they're absolute, sometimes they're relative, but that just depends on your r vector you plug in. So acceleration of c normal is going to be my omega of cd squared, not the vector. We can't actually square a vector. We can just take that scalar term squared in the negative r of c relative to d. So drawing these terms for point C, we have our alpha of CD that's here. We're going to cross that into this R vector. That's going to result in a assumed tangential acceleration, acceleration of C tangential going up that direction. Now the normal goes back in the negative R direction. So this is my acceleration of C normal. That takes care of those. No need to draw the next two terms because they're for point A and they both go to zero. Now getting into the acceleration of P relative to to a. We have the first here, the alpha of AB as a vector crossed with my R of P relative to A as a vector. Let's draw that term. So if my alpha is positive from the right hand rule, crossing that into this R vector, acceleration of that marker point P relative to A tangential going up to our right. The next term we have We'll add on here, and I'm actually keeping this fairly lined up, if you noticed. So there's that term, that term, that term. Now our acceleration of P relative A normal is going to be our omega of AB squared times negative R of P relative to A as a vector. So that one will actually continue up this arm in the same direction the slipping tangential is going. So this would be my acceleration of... P relative to A normal. Turns out we're going to have a lot of things going along that arm. So that takes care of that one. We already drew our acceleration of C relative to P. It turns out this is really commonly a unknown in these problems. Now, the way you can write this as an unknown is an unknown magnitude. So acceleration of C relative to P tangential. We don't know the value, but we could define our direction. And that direction is going to come from this angle over here, right? So this angle of 60 degrees. So opposite side of that angle is going to be the I hat and then the adjacent Jason is going to be the J hat, and so we could write this. Um, we've as assumed it's going up to the left, right? We're looking at this vector right here, and so it would have a negative I hat, so we can write that as a negative sine of 60 in the I hat plus, it's also going to be related to 60 for the J hat, but that's going to be positive because it's going upward, so positive cosine of 60 in the J hat. Okay, so that takes care of this term all the way from here to here. We didn't have a slipping normal, and we do have a Coriolis. Let me tab my Coriolis onto the end. So we have plus two times the omega of contain that contains point P. So that omega is going to be our omega of a b that is a vector and we cross that into the slipping velocity, our velocity of c relative to p as a vector. All right, last step is to draw that one. We're in a good place here to go ahead and draw it. So we have our omega being positive from the right-hand rule, and we're going to cross that into this velocity vector. Okay, so positive coming out of the screen, rolling down your fingers in the direction of VC slash P, or using your three-finger right-hand rule if you prefer that. We end up with a Coriolis acceleration, which is coming down this direction here. So our A Coriolis is coming down to the left. Now keep in mind, it will always be perpendicular to that velocity vector because cross products always find a vector perpendicular to both vectors that you feed it. And so there's our Coriolis. You can also think that the Coriolis is going to be in the same direction, at least the same line of action. So line of action LOA as our normal slipping acceleration, if it exists. On this problem, it didn't happen to exist. But you can also think it's going to be perpendicular to your acceleration of C slash P tangential, right? Just various ways to think through it. 
All right, so to get everything here on one screen, we can take a look at our overall work. We found our equation. We figured out that the subscripts had to cancel for this four bar linkage. We established a marker point. We used the same subscripts for our velocity as we did for our acceleration. We expanded the terms out one by one. It turns out in this bottom problem here, because we're given all of the different geometry and we already solved for our omegas in the previous step, that our two unknowns that we'd solve for would be this acceleration of C relative to P tangential. And then the last one would be our not given acceleration. Okay, so we were given our alpha of AB, we were not given our alpha of CD. And so those will show up as your two unknowns coming out of your two equations, the I hat and J hat isolated versions of this equation. Hopefully that's helpful in getting you to think through these very complicated problems. I believe that you can learn this. I know it's some tough stuff, but keep moving forward. Thanks.